New York City restaurants continue to struggle, unable to fully recover from the COVID restrictions that forced many eateries to close. And now there are new challenges. The point starts right now. New York City's food world is still being eaten away by the aftermath of COVID. Andrew Ridgie of the New York City Hospitality Alliance and Lloyd Gordon, owner of Nears Tavern in Woodhaven, Queens, are here to talk about the latest challenges. So, you know, restaurants, a lot of restaurants, hundreds, maybe even thousands of restaurants, went out of business during the pandemic. Is there any hope of any of them making a comeback? Well, let's hope. I mean, we know people want to go out and eat and drink and celebrate and socialize, but it is just incredibly difficult to operate a restaurant or a bar in this environment, especially after the past couple of years. So if people can get investments uh, privately, hopefully some will come back. Unfortunately, the government let too many of these small businesses fail, shutter, vacant storefronts and didn't give them the support they need. The, so it's the government's fault? Is it the city's fault, the state's fault, the federal government's fault? Well, Who are you blaming? So in, in New York alone, about 65% of restaurants that applied for the Federal Restaurant Revitalization Fund grant were shut out because the money was quickly exhausted. And they, uh, unfortunately, and they closed? And well, not all of them closed. A lot of them closed. I think many still have back rent to pay and they wow. have other challenges dealing with inflation, much higher labor costs. Uh, so I think a lot of them are still teetering and may shutter. But that's one failure because one restaurant on a block got a big grant to pay back rent and all these other expenses. And then the one right across the street got nothing. Mr. Gordon, your restaurant was on life support a number of times. I wonder. Have you ever thought about packing it in? And what were the challenges that you faced in trying to keep it open? Uh, I think um, <laughs> all restaurants have faced that decision multiple times. But I feel like we are resilient. Uh, the small restaurant mom and pop owners are very resilient. They're not just there for profit, they're there for purpose and passion. And that also has a way of pushing you forward when but you're faced with things like that. Tell me what was going on in your head and in your heart as you had to make this decision. Should I stay open? Should I close? And can I even afford to do this? Yeah, it definitely was a challenging time. And I did close the doors. We tried to take out but with the delivery fees, it just wasn't sustainable. And the danger of uncertainty of how safe is this when you have customers coming to support you? Do you really want to put people under that, especially in the early part of the pandemic? So we end up closing and we were unsure if we were going to open. But we did get a lot of help. And why did you the... finally decide to open? Oh, well, when you start hearing stories of uh, customers that say, you know, my great grandmother brought me there, or uh, this is the place where, uh, you know, I first had my first drink, or this is my first date, or I met my wife there. I mean, those things like that might not have monetary value, but they push you forward. And that's been pushing me forward for the past 14 years. So those customer stories is what pushed you forward to reopen again and to want to stay open despite all the fiscal challenges and the mountains you had to climb in order to do it. Absolutely. You know, uh, people forget where there is well, there's a well, there's a way. And so we had the will to survive. And so we found different ways to duct tape different uh, support systems to make sure we could actually pay the hard costs of not able to pay the rent because we don't have the money coming in. But people put care packages together. They started do donating. So those are where the will comes in and it started to create this uh, support system that allowed us to reopen, especially when they had outdoor dining, which was a lifesaver. Andrew, what was the biggest, what are the challenges that other restaurants are facing to open, to close? What are the things, the impediments to some of these places that did close to reopening? You know, a lot of it had to do with the cost, right? The rent, not being able to pay back rent for months. Inflation hit at the same time, so the cost of goods have skyrocketed. While the Adams administration has been doing a lot, there's still so much more to be done to help cut 
the red tape, break through that bureaucracy, make sure that you streamline the permanent licensing process so you can actually open up quickly. Well, tell me what this red tape is. What is the red tape? Well, I can tell you right now one of the big challenges is when you're trying to open up a new place and you have to get the gas turned on so you can start cooking, but you're waiting on multiple agencies. Sometimes they're telling you different things. One agency comes one week, the next comes the other week, tells you something completely different, and then you have weeks to wait to come and get a card, basically, that means you can get your gas turned on. That means people are burning through capital and any money that they had, and it poses a lot of stresses. I'd like to ask you both this question. Do you think that landlords should renegotiate leases, and instead of the making the rent based on whatever they want to do it, make it based on a percentage of the actual profits that a restaurant is making. What do you think about that idea? I think that uh, after this pandemic hit and we realized that this rent is very hard to pay even when things are operating properly, uh, we started to reimagine different ways of doing the tenant landlord situation. And there have been several instances where restaurant owners start to transition where it's a more a percentage of gross sales. And that's something you've seen that's starting to happen now. Uh, so I'm, I'm very optimistic that they're going to continue to start making more of these changes that's more sustainable. If you look at uh, Aleva uh, Cheese, uh, Ameri one of America's oldest cheese places that's closing, is because of the rent. So we have to kind of reach, uh, reimagine all this, redefine how do we create these tenant landlord situation that helps a small business continue on. But you know, there's also the the landlords have certain costs as well. They have mortgages. They have, I guess, I don't know whether they sometimes they pay the heat. And, and, and electric bills. And so the question then becomes, what is it that they need that you can form some kind of a, an agreement that they can get what they need and you can get what you need. I mean, Andrew, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, listen, we saw throughout the pandemic there were some really great landlords that worked with small businesses and did everything to help them stay open and be able to reopen when they were permitted. And there were others that just didn't want to negotiate. And I think it's going to be a fine balance. Aren't we talking about a new reality, though? It is a new reality. But I also think that landlords, at least the smart ones, recognize that restaurants and bars are more than just any type of business. Yes, they're part of the economics, but they're also part of like the cultural and social the fabric ecosystem. Of the community. So if you want to attract office workers in your building, guess what? They want a great restaurant to go to and a great bar for a happy hour. If you have a residential building, people want to be by great restaurants. So I think they're not only the business that's there, but there's so much added on value because New York City can't recover unless our restaurants and our bars like Loy's at Nears Tavern are really at the core of the recovery yeah. because that's why people are in New York for so many reasons, why so many people come here to work, to visit, and um, it's something people relate to, you know? You relate to restaurants, bars, yeah. food. It's our social spaces. Yeah. But I wonder what role remote work is playing in the fact that restaurants are having such a hard time. Is it affecting you as much because your restaurant is in Queens, uh, Mr. Gordon, or is it more of a Manhattan thing because less people have come back to work in Manhattan? Uh, I think that's a really great question. Um, I haven't uh, experienced the direct correlation uh, with the remote work, uh, but I know I have friends that have places in Manhattan, and they're totally devastated by uh, you know less and less foot traffic. We pay uh, sign leases based on how much foot traffic is passing by that store. And when you don't have that, but you still are locked into a lease, now you're just faced with an impossible situation. And so that's what's happening in Manhattan and those high traffic areas that have saw the decrease. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, office workers not being here, only being here a few days a week in Manhattan, particularly commercial district, is really, really challenging. There's a new report that the average person is spending several thousand dollars less every year in these commercial districts because of remote work. So it's those restaurants, you know, someone's not running in grabbing your egg sandwich and your coffee, your salad or your grain bowl during lunch. And then people aren't go excuse me, going to the happy hour after work, you know? They're not going out for that after, uh, you know, work dinner or that business lunch. So, so Mondays and, and Fridays are like the lowest days because people come in maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? Yeah, definitely. It's been a lot slower. And I think people just need to recognize just because they see a busy restaurant on a Thursday, say, that doesn't mean that everything's all fine and the restaurant industry is recovered. So I wonder if, if this is the new normal, what does that mean for the industry's happy hour and things like that? I mean, does that mean that goes away? 
I mean, personally, I have seen uh, people doing more uh, extended happy hour. You know, happy hour has always been, you know, an hour. Uh, but we now it's going to be five hours. Now it's a five <laughs> very hours. Happy time. It, it's happy well, hours. Very happy um, time. Yeah, yeah. You know, but that's what we're seeing happening to uh, uh, just to match the market, uh, what the consumer wants. And I, I think you know, uh, bars and restaurants are always adapting. And I hate to say this word, but pivoting. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to be right back with more from my guests. We're back dishing about restaurants and the challenges that they face. So there's a new challenge because the mayor has announced that he's going to allow union uh, workers to develop a pilot program that would allow city workers to work remotely at least part of the time. What effect is that going to have on the restaurant industry in New York? Well, we know if there's fewer people in these central business districts and in these areas, there's fewer people that are going to be spending money at local restaurants and local bars. So it's it's going to impact them and uh, as Lloyd said you know the industry has continued to have to pivot and this is something particularly in those areas they're going to have to figure out fewer people means fewer people are spending money in those areas but here's the question it seems to me that when you do we say that people aren't coming to the central business district what it means is they're not coming to like lower Manhattan but they are if they work from home probably going out to get food it just may be in the boroughs or maybe in the suburbs so is the restaurant industry going to change and will more restaurants spring up in those areas to deal with people who are working remotely what do you think Lloyd? um i i think um we still are uh, experimenting yeah uh all of this change that have happened is uh, the dust hasn't settled yet and uh, I can only predict that this will, is going to be another tumultuous uh, time of adapting and pivoting and trying to figure that out but I know for certain those areas that's going to experience the decline might experience more closures and less economic activity less sales tax less employment yeah. uh, so we have to be careful uh, when elected leaders make legislation and they've never owned a business or never understand how to run this small margin type uh, restaurant industry. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, some restaurants lost, maybe other restaurants gains in other areas of the five boroughs, and that may just be the reality. But I also suspect when people are working from home, they may not be spending as much. So if you're working from home, Good point. you know, you may not be going out and getting your coffee and an egg sandwich. You may just make it at home. Same thing goes for lunch. So. We have to see. It's definitely going to help. It's going to change the dynamics. It's an ever-evolving city, but again, you know, Manhattan and these central business districts have also been like the beating heart of our city, pumping tax revenue and bringing people. So I think we also have to understand that we have to support these businesses because they're sure. facing unique challenges. So let's talk about outdoor dining. Hmm. The mayor in his State of the City speech sort of surprised people by calling some of these dining sheds, quote, COVID cabins and saying that they need to be reimagined. What are your thoughts about this? We'll start with you, Lloyd. Uh, listen, I'm going to tell you now, uh, the facts are the facts. Without outdoor dining, New York City's oldest bar would be closed. It would be gone. Uh, we didn't have any other option uh, but to have people eat on the street. Uh, however, we looked at this and said, we can make this better. We can make this nicer. And if you look at some of these outdoor structures, they're amazing. You know, they just gave us a framework to rebuild better, to really make it nice. But we just need to figure out, okay, are, are our legislators going to pass the laws so that the restaurants have the freedom to build something that everybody enjoy? Well, see, we're waiting now, as you yes. know, Andrew, for the city council mm -hmm. to pass legislation that's going to establish a whole bunch of things, regulations, what months you can have have the structure out there, whether it has to be removed in the winter, where it can stay up 12 months a year, whether, um, you know, how big they can be, whether they can be on the street or the sidewalk. There's lots of things, you know, should they all be the same size? So hasn't this left restaurants sort of, you know, wondering what's going to happen and being unable to hire staff because they don't know how many people they're going to need? Well, that's spot on. You know, we know this outdoor dining program saved thousands of restaurants. I think it's credited with saving about 100,000 jobs. And restaurants like Lloyd's really relied on it. But today, almost every day, I hear from restaurants saying, I want to invest and upgrade and make changes to my outdoor dining because it's gotten beat up through the summer, the spring, the winter, multiple, multiple times 
times over during the pandemic, but I don't want to invest money in it if next week the city is going to come and tell me, oh, no, we're changing all the rules and we're changing the game on you again. So we need clear guidance that's standardized, that's sustainable, cuts the red tape, doesn't cost too much money for small restaurants to participate in, but really is upgraded and addresses a lot of the issues so we don't have, quote, unquote, COVID shacks or sheds. We have beautiful sidewalk cafes, streeteries, outdoor dining cabanas, and really what we need. So, Lloyd, if you could talk directly to members of the city council and make your case, what would you say to them about what you, how you would envision a permanent outdoor dining plan? Uh, well, I think there uh, it's important to have a, a small group task force come together because I have ideas and we all have different ideas, but what might work in Manhattan might not work in uh, certain areas of the city. Well, what are your ideas? What would you like to see? Oh, I definitely like to have the option of having uh, the the street uh, option. Uh, I think people uh, are now able to enjoy outdoors. Uh, so if we could provide that outdoor uh, setup, I think it's going to be really, really beneficial. Um, I, I mean, right now we're looking at we took down our outdoor structure. Uh, it became hard to maintain. Um, there was no guidance. Why keep paying all this money for something that wasn't meant to last three, four, five years. Um, I just think we should really just get to the table and try to figure this out. And I don't have an exact solution because I'm not going to make a solution for all. That doesn't work in New York City. It's too diverse. So, Andrew, there's also a question in terms of staffing because you're going to hire more people if you're going to have an outdoor structure. I'm wondering, you know, there has been staffing problems mm -hmm. as well. It, should we rush permits for some of the asylum seekers so they could work and feel that they could be working without getting in trouble? Yeah, our city's restaurants and bars still employ about 35,000 fewer people than they did before the pandemic. Pandemic. So, yes, yeah. wow. so that's like a small city, you know, or even a big city compared to for some people. Um, so, absolutely, that's been a conversation. You have, you know, adults here, many of whom may even have experience working in restaurants. Uh, we need to expedite their work authorization because it's not good to have adults just in our city not working. They want to work. Restaurants want to hire them. If they can help contribute to the city, generate tax revenue, serve people great meals, cook great meals, like why not? We just need, again, the federal government to take action so places like Loy's Restaurant and others actually have a chance. So there's another issue that's facing restaurants now, and that is that Grubhub and other companies that deliver food for your restaurants want to increase the cap the amount of money they can charge you to deliver your food. They want to go, they want to, the cap is now 15%. And I wonder, is this a good thing, a bad thing? Is this is just another way to get more money out of restaurants and can it put more restaurants out of business? Why? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to tell you now, and I'm going to talk from a story of one of my friends who had the only diner, Paul, in Woodhaven, Queens. And I remember when the big advertisement pandemic hit, the, uh, the third-party apps decided, oh, we're going to waive the fees. And he came and he told me, he said, Lloyd, I just discovered they're not waiving the fees. They were actually a deferral. Uh, he ended up owing thousands and thousands of dollars during that time of pandemic, relying just on third-party apps. Eventually closed his, closed his only diner in Woodhaven, and it's now gone. Uh, so that's what's, what's happened, uh, and that's the byproduct of some of these fees. So we have about 30 seconds left. Andrew, what's your take on this? Yeah, we need to keep these fees intact. Unfortunately, the big delivery companies have been brutalizing small restaurants for years and years and years. This fee cap has helped save so many, especially throughout the pandemic. And if the city council moves and guts this fee cap, they are basically going to be responsible for seeing fees skyrocketing on restaurants. And so they're going to say these, what are they these said. Are these going to be passed along to the consumer, or is the they're restaurant going to have to? It's going to be more money for the consumer because restaurants are going to have to increase their price. Restaurants used to say, I couldn't afford to be on these third-party delivery websites, but I can't afford not to be on these third-party delivery websites. There needs to be sensible regulation, and the council cannot gut the fee cap because they're basically undermining a small business protection that people fought for for years that was finally enacted. So third-party delivery is very important. But we can't just give them a completely unregulated marketplace. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there for now. But our conversation continues right after the show on our streaming channel, CBS News New York.